Dutch illustrator Louis Raymakers is now largely forgotten, but during his life he was widely known in Europe and America. He was born in 1869, and although it isn't recorded where he studied, his first job was as an art teacher, while also working as a reasonably successful landscape artist and occasional illustrator. He was already 37 years old when in 1906 he started to draw political cartoons for Dutch newspapers, and in 1909 he took the staff cartoonist job at the Telegraph, and he earned a reputation as an astute visual commentator on the insanity of politics. When war broke out across Europe in 1914, Holland was among the countries who declared themselves neutral. Raymakers was far from happy about this, and he used his obvious talent for making visual statements to try to persuade Holland to join the Allies against Germany. Although some of his work addressed the general human tragedy and loss of life, he also created many images which were merciless in their depiction of the Kaiser and his forces as vicious barbarians. The Dutch government, fearful of the German's reaction to these attacks, frequently confiscated and destroyed his work. He travelled to London in 1915 to put in an appearance at an exhibition of his work at a Bond Street gallery. He immediately decided that life in London was preferable to Holland and he sent for his family to join him there. Soon after his arrival he was offered a contract by the Daily Mail newspaper and his potent drawings were published in their pages up to the eventual end of the war. Britain's propaganda bureau were keen to utilise Raymaker's work and 40 of his most venomous cartoons were published as a book and distributed throughout the Allied countries to keep everyone focused on why they were fighting. And other albums, pamphlets, posters, postcards and even cigarette cards bearing reproductions of his work were also widely distributed. A lot of his work was created directly onto lithographic stone with wax crayon and there are some pencil and watercolour images, and quite a few etchings. But what they all had in common was his distinctive energetic linear style. His lecture tour of America in 1917 was financed by the British government in the hope he would help convince America to join the war. Over 2,000 American newspapers published examples of his work, and it's generally acknowledged that he did help to get the USA on board. After the war had ended, Raymakers and his family returned to mainland Europe and settled in Brussels in Belgium. With no war to illustrate, he was nothing like as in demand, but he carried on working for the newspapers with lighter, more comical material, and he created a comic book of sorts in 1927 titled Health is the Greatest Treasure. By the time the Second World War was about to erupt in 1939, Raymakers was 70 years old and he returned to the USA and stayed until the war ended when he headed back to Brussels. In 1953 he finally went back to the Netherlands and he died three years later at the age of 87 in 1953. French humorous illustrator Joseph Hamard was one of the first to demonstrate that simplicity could be every bit as communicative as more complex illustration styles. He was born in Les Mureaux, a small town northwest of Paris in 1880. There's no record of his family circumstances, childhood or art education, and I've been unable to find any work created by him before 1907. In that year, his images started to appear in several popular humour magazines, such as Le Rire and La Siette au Beur. But at this point, he hadn't yet fully mastered his chosen style. The close-ups and facial expressions in particular were far from descriptive, but he quickly refined his deceptively loose linear scrawl to communicate more clearly. When the war came, he joined the army, but was captured early on and imprisoned until it was over in 1918. After the war, he set about rebuilding his career, and he moved away from magazines towards the illustration of books. His illustrated edition of Molière's Le Malade Imaginaire was published in 1920, and it was a great popular success. The images were created by Hemard as line drawings, which were then coloured using the laborious Pochoir stencil method. This was followed by his exuberant line-only images for Rabelais' tale of Gargantua et Pantagruel in 1922. 
Most significantly, he was commissioned in 1925 to illustrate the family law provisions of Le Code Civil. For most illustrators, this would have been the commission from hell. But miraculously, Hemard created a series of amusing pen and posh wire spot cartoons which managed to both inform and entertain the reader. In 1927, he returned to more literary material with his copiously illustrated edition of the story of Cyrano de Bergerac. Fable de la Fontaine followed in 1930, and for this book he created his images for each fable as a decorative page header, again using pochoir print. But as time went on, his work was increasingly reproduced by colour lithography, and throughout the 1930s, commissions for all kinds of work, and not only books, continued to roll in. When war broke out again in 1939, he continued to live and work in Paris, and was considered harmless and left alone by the occupying German forces. His comic book, Le Celebre Cucurel et le Capitaine Lapisto, was published at this time and the book would prove to be enduringly popular with French comic fans. In 1944 he took on the challenge of the French tax code and once again he turned remarkably tedious text into entertaining, easily understood images. By the later 40s his prodigious work rate began to slow down but in 1947, at the age of 67, he illustrated a memorable edition of Briat Savarin's classic work on the subject of food, Physiology de Gou. His last published work was for Voltaire's philosophical book, Zadig, in 1954, and Joseph Himard died in Paris at the age of 81 in 1961. The unconventional personal life and ultimately tragic story of Danish artist and illustrator Gerda Wegener have been used as the basis for the novel and subsequent film The Danish Girl. But here I'm only concerning myself with her career as an illustrator, which frequently gets ignored. She was born Gerda Gottlieb in 1886 in a village near the city of Granar, and at 18 she enrolled at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts. There she met and not long after married fellow student Einar Wegener and they graduated from the academy in 1907. They travelled together throughout Italy and France and eventually settled in Paris in 1912. They considered themselves to be artists but in a bid for more regular income Gerda began making contacts in the worlds of publishing and advertising and quickly found success. Einar remained an artist and struggled accordingly, but it was Gerda's new source of income which kept them solvent. By 1915 she had become a fairly frequent contributor to both La Vie Parisienne and La Bayonette, and her delicate, playfully erotic images continued to feature on their covers and in their pages into the following decade. She also had some pochoir fashion work printed in La Gazette du Bonton, and not much later she was also appearing in the pages of the French edition of Vogue. In 1918 she was commissioned to illustrate the story L'Abdication de Ris Oranges by Leo Laguer. For this book she created a series of immaculate pen and ink monochromes, which clearly demonstrated the stylistic influence of British decadent illustrator Aubrey Beardsley. Given that she also had a flourishing career as an artist, she was a remarkably prolific illustrator, and she was also eclectic in her acceptance of commissions from all manner of sources. Whether she was creating sexually explicit material for limited edition pornography, which she did on quite a few occasions, or producing press advertising, she tackled all assignments with the same flair and aesthetic consideration. Her delicate application of line and washes of watercolour and gouache gave even her most graphically sexual images a light-hearted and visually absorbing appeal. This was particularly true of her series of illustrations for Casanova's Erotic Adventures, which was published in 1927. It was an ideal marriage of writer and artist, and it sold in large quantities, as much for Wegener's images as for Casanova's accounts of his debauchery. Sadly, her husband died in 1931 after undergoing surgery, and although devastated by the loss, Wegener rather hastily married a young Italian diplomat and moved with him to Morocco. From there she continued to work, and her images for the erotic book Fortunio by Theophile Gautier in 1934 were a clear reminder of her facility for stylized adult material. 
Not long after, she discovered that her husband had been embezzling her accumulated wealth throughout their marriage, and they divorced in 1936. Two years later, she returned to Denmark, but she was unable to generate any interest in her work, and she had to live in obscurity on the small amount her second husband hadn't yet stolen. What money she had she spent on alcohol and she died of a heart attack in 1940 at the age of only 54. Wallace Smith was an American book illustrator, comic artist, reporter, author and screenwriter and he enjoyed equal success with his writing and his illustration. He was born in 1888 in an unknown location and his given name was Schmidt so it's likely his parents were German immigrants. At some point before he had begun working, he had anglicised it to Smith, as many Europeans did. At the age of only 20 in 1908, he became the Washington correspondent for the Chicago American, and in his first year working there, he originated the Joe Blow single-panel comic spot. This series demonstrated his prowess in pen and ink, with distinctive brittle line work which featured some equally distinctive hatching. Early on in his career at the newspaper, he was sent to Mexico to cover the revolution currently being led by Pancho Villa, and he drew many affectionate, mildly comic pictures of the revolutionaries and wrote accounts of their bid to oust the Carranza regime. He stayed with the newspaper for more than 10 years, but was also active as an illustrator, and he created the cover for The Shadow Eater in 1915, after which he turned freelance as both a writer and illustrator. In 1922 he created a series of mesmerising black and white illustrations for Ben Hecht's novel Fantasius Malere, A Mysterious Oath. This book proved to be extremely controversial because of its sexual content, and although there was nothing remotely pornographic in the illustrations, both Hecht and Smith were tried and each fined for obscenity to the tune of what would now be about $15,000 each. Following the widely publicised trial, the publisher quickly printed another 2,000 copies and sold them under the counter at greatly inflated prices. Both the style and content of Smith's images were unusual in an American illustrator of this period. The pen and ink technique he used for all his monochrome work showed an obvious influence of both Aubrey Beardsley and Harry Clark. But he was no mere copyist and he had his own distinctive precise line style, which he used expressively in both his serious and humorous work. In 1923 and 1924 he contributed illustrations to Ben Hecht's magazine The Literary Times. For some reason he signed his work using the alias Vulgus. He also illustrated Hecht's book, The Florentine Dagger, published in 1923. A little later he moved to Hollywood and began a successful decade-long career, writing screenplays for various movies, including adaptations of two of his own novels. In his 1925 book, Oregon Sketches, Smith created a series of drawings of the American West, past and present, and his drawing of a Bronco rider was subsequently bought copyright and all by the Pendleton Roundup Association. He spent the rest of his life in Hollywood where he died of a heart attack in 1937 at the premature age of 49. That's it for now, more is on the way. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.